Hi, I'm Justin Garnett, co-founder of BasketMakerAtLabel.com, which is an informational website about the indigenous um, spear throwers of Native America. In this video, I'm going to be showing you how to make a set of sand dune cave style atlatl finger loops. This is a set of sand dune cave style atlatl finger loops. There are a lot of variants on this design in the archaeologic record. In fact, there's almost as many variations on this theme as there are examples of it. However, there are a number of uh, very consistent uh, features of it. One, they are relatively um, inflexible, generally have a uh, fiber core of some sort, and they are bound on usually both above and below the, uh, below the actual indentions cut into the wood for the fingers. They generally fit um, very tightly. Uh, these are actually fairly fairly loose, um, and they are extraordinarily strong. They are bound to a ligature groove through the inside of this, um, underneath this uh, piece of leather, um, and are essentially impossible to pull off the, uh, off the shaft of the atlatl without first uh, soaking them in water. This is the atlatl to which I'm going to be adding loops to. This seems an opportune time to mention how I um, measure an atlatl to my own body. The length of my atlatl is from my armpit to the point on my hand where my middle finger um, separates from the rest of my hand. This is about the length that I like an atlatl to be when the end of the handle is pressed up against the inside of my armpit. In terms of the headspace length, um, a rule of thumb that I like to use, and this gets me just based on the size of my fingers, this gets me to about exactly the same uh, dimensions as the uh, Kinboko Canyon um, atlatl. Um, I take three fingers, line them up with the top of the uh, headspace, and then the end of my finger will fall right where I want the spur to be. I also use the same measurement for the uh, for the um, loading groove. Now that this is a, a fairly short groove um, and would be longer if I were um, inducing less uh, flex, less upward curvature in the atlatl. This is the treatment of the handle. I have made two indentions for my fingers just just slightly larger um, than the than the uh, curvature of my fingers and then I have tapered the shaft on either side of these grooves in order to produce lugs and ligature grooves. These will be the points of attachment where the loops will be connected to the handle. Alright, now I've got the tools that I need to actually produce these loops. Here I have a bundle of um, willow bark. This can be any form of, any form of cordage um, or sinew or anything that's somewhat somewhat stiff yet uh, flexible. I have a bundle of gut which I'm going to use as bindings um, in place of sinew. I obviously have my atlatl and I have a piece of leather for the loops themselves. Now I've already cut this cut this to shape. There's a number of variants of this style of loop. Um, the example that I showed earlier um, doesn't have this attachment um, connected to the to the actual loop itself, although it has one um, so, uh, added on later. Now, on the sand dune cave atlatl itself, this is actually this piece is actually um, the same piece of leather as the piece which becomes the loops. However, in my case, I have sewn it on uh, with gut. So what you're going to do is take your fiber, make sure that your fiber is long enough for the loop. Then these dimensions aren't critical, neither are these, because um, everybody is going to have a different preference for how large they want all these things to be, so I'm not really going to be saying exactly how big these things are. So here I have some hide glue. I'm going to paint some hide glue onto the inside of this uh, leather so that when I roll it up on itself it will stick to itself and that'll actually make it um, become much less pliable when it dries. It'll become very hard as if it was um, rawhide. 
Now, I think a lot of these um, were probably actually made from um, rawhide, uh, thin, thin animal skins, which I don't necessarily think were um, were dressed hide, probably just just rawhide. But I don't really have any way of, of knowing that for sure. Now take your um, your fiber. Roll this all up, being careful to make sure that you uh, don't allow a lot of air to uh, build up, and big air bubbles to form on the inside of this uh, of this leather. It's probably better to work from one side and then move over to the other. These are actually on, kind of on the on the thick side. Probably could have afforded to make this material a little thinner. I'm just going to clip this, the tails of this uh, fiber off, just so that they're you know out of my way right now. So now this is what I have. I have this uh, piece here. So the next step is then to figure out where this is going to fall on the outlaw shaft. So I need to figure out exactly how wide my atlatl is. I usually do that by just setting it behind it and just kind of eyeballing. Um, and then take an X-Acto knife or um, a stone blade works well for this actually. Um, and just make a series of cuts down through your alternate layers, the rolled layers of, um, of hide. Try not to cut through too much of the fiber on the inside, because you kind of want it to to remain uh, to remain durable and, and in one piece. This is actually a fairly tricky step in the production of these finger loops. Uh, so a lot of you really need to take a lot of care when you're cutting through here. I usually try to cut this, these slits a little smaller than the shaft of the atlatl because I want it to kind of um, grip it when it all dries down. So now I'm going to thread this through. See it's a little smaller, so it squeaks as it, as it, pushes, as it pushes up. So now I bring it up to the bottom of the first groove. You'll see I have a constriction down here now. And I have a piece which is now coming up the back. It comes up the back of the outlatl between where my finger, where my finger loops are going to go. So that's exactly what I want. I'm going to cut off a little bit of the excess fiber which I damaged as I pushed through. Now I'm going to get out some some gut. Now you can use this, you can use this split, or you can use this um, in its full round form. Um, I tend to prefer to uh, to split it and rip it down into uh, smaller, smaller pieces, especially for um, my over wraps, um, the decorative over wraps which are going to go around my uh, around my loops. That will probably be enough right there for the decorative over wrap. Now I will take this strip of sinew. I'm going to bring it, tie it very tightly, extremely tightly, around that lower lower groove. Bring it up a couple times, under, over again. There's a lot of tension on this gut right now. So now that I have it nice and tight, I just snap it by hand, and it'll stick to itself relatively well. Eventually, I'll put a little bit of a uh, hide glue on that to keep it to keep it in place. But um, it's pretty it's pretty much solidly um, where it's gonna where it's gonna stay. Try to make that bridge the um, the lower lug so that the lower lug isn't in the way of your uh, of your fingers. Bend this piece in so that you know where it's going to be tied. You know where it's going to be tied in there. And now take another piece, another piece of gut. I might actually need to uh, go inside and get a, a bit more um, to complete these loops. But let me go ahead and split this here since it's in its 
it's in its full round. Just kind of split a little bit of this out. Okay, so now I have these um, nice strips, nice strips of, uh, of gut. Make this a little more, a little more even here. Okay. The dog, of course, is very sad that he's trapped inside and doesn't get to come out here and doesn't get to come out here and help. So one of the key things to remember about this is that you are actually tying your finger loops to this groove. So wrap around the groove good and tight, then pull your finger loop in, yank it down as tight as you can to get it held down into that, into that groove there. Now on the other side, go ahead and repeat the same process of bending your finger loop. Some people use sizing forms for this, and I have in the past, but I really feel like they're, they're more trouble than they're worth if you're not trying to make your loops um, perfectly, perfectly round, and um, generally I'm not. Generally I'm making a, a utilitarian tool, I'm not making necessarily an art piece. So tie it down as tight as you can with this, um, with this gut or uh, sinew. The nice thing about, about sinew and gut and things of that nature is that they kind of stick to themselves. So they're fairly easy to, to work with. So now I have a set of, um, of loops, which uh, fit here quite, quite nicely, but you'll notice they're, they're not finished yet. So there's a number of things, of steps that are left to, uh, left to perform now. Um, the first and foremost is applying a cross seizing to this so that um, they are immobilized and they uh, are held nicely, held nicely in place. So what, what this means is I'm going to take a piece, I'm going to put it through here, bring it up from the inside, and then twist it around each of these areas here, around each attachment point for the, for the, um, for the loop. And what that'll do is when this gut shrinks as it dries, it will hold those um, finger loops completely immobile. They will not be capable of moving until this um, gut is um, softened. So you would do that if you wanted to replace these finger loops. You would do that by sticking this in a tub of water uh, for a, a little little period of time. Um, usually it doesn't take very long, like uh, five minutes is probably more than sufficient. So you're going to bind good and tight all through here. Sure that, that is all tight. Okay, so now I have that nice and tightened. And what I like to do at this point is to take the excess that I have and bring it around um, a couple of times from different directions, just to create kind of a uh, kind of an X pattern across um, here. Now that's that's especially useful if you're um, not planning on um, having this piece, uh, because this piece is going to effectively cover all of those cover all of those bindings. Um, so nah, it's not really necessary to make any of that stuff um, very pretty. So we have this um, now tied on. You'll notice it's actually tight enough now that I really could throw with this allotl at this point, um, even with the bindings um, completely wet. I, I wouldn't recommend doing it, and I wouldn't recommend throwing many times but they're very, very sturdy. Now, at this point, there are a couple of, um, a couple of things to be done. Um, you could put a decorative overwrap over these, like on the example that I showed earlier, but I'm actually not going to do that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to bring these tips back down and tie them in place. Now, that is one of the conserved features on these types of loops. Lots of people, um, you know, over time um, in the archaeologic record have done a lot of different... Um, personal styles of these loops. However, this is very, very common um, on these, these types of loops. This is a very, very common um, thing to be done, is to pull these ends back down and tie them in place. And I believe that the reason for that is because um, this 
makes the um, it makes the the ligature um, which is holding this loop on captive. It, it is incapable of um, of coming loose once this is um, is put on. So this step really does a great job of um, anchoring the anchoring the finger loops um, to the outlaw. So you'll see it's tied down nice and good. So you could saw this off with a with a flake or a, or a blade. Um, obviously, I'm using a pair of scissors. So now I'll go ahead and take another um, another piece and repeat the same process um, on the other side. Um, I'm actually probably not going to edit this out. I'm probably going to uh, show both of these just because, whenever possible, I like to really give people an idea of um, how long these types of um, tasks actually take. So I'm going to try to get as much of this stuff in as possible, you know, if it's not entirely, um, you know, boring beyond belief or I make a whole bunch of fudge ups and have to repeat a lot of it. I um, don't think that's going to happen. Okay, so now I stick all this, um, all this gut down. Um, I have a little bit of an extra tail of gut sticking out from underneath here. Well, that's not critical, so I'm just going to cut it. So now I have my uh, finger loops. Actually, trim off a little bit of this side too. And this is why I don't actually really bother to measure any of my pieces before, because a lot of it's going to get cut off. So now I take this piece, which is sewn to the bottom here, and this is this is done for additional um, stability. This holds um, everything in nice and strong, very similar to the uh, to the retention loop that goes around the back of the uh, White Dog Cave um, model, which is a very different, very different style, but the same same thought process. So, you bring a wrap of, of uh, your uh, binding around. When this dries, it'll hold it nicely, nicely in place. So now what I have is two tails. I put these tails one each, as you'll, you'll see, it's shaped like this. Now I put like a wishbone. Now I put this through. Since I'm working on this, obviously I'm like pulling the, the edges of the gut up where I've bound them on. But when you're done, you just kind of press it all down and let it let it dry. So now I have these pieces coming back up through. I pull them tight into these um, grooves right here. And what that does is it makes this loop appear more round and it actually uh, puts uh, a little bit of leather over a hard spot right here where the lug is and that makes it much more comfortable to use this um, use this a lot in the long run so then I tie this pull it up like yay get myself my last piece uh, my last piece of gut bind around and the thing to remember about gut again is um, it's very nice because as it dries, it will um, it will not only harden um, and make all of your bindings um, inflexible, but it will shrink and make all of your um, all of your bindings um, tighter. So now I kind of smooth out the bands of uh, of the binding with my fingers, just to get them as nice and um, as nice and uh, neat as I can. Um, I'll probably actually come back in and, and apply a little bit more. A little bit more gut over the top of that, just to get it. Um, well, I might have enough right here. Yeah, this is this is going to do me fine. So I wrap this around again, make it nice and, and neat. Cut off my excess here. Kind of want to be careful not to really nick the wood when you're doing this. So press the uh, press the edges down. My uh, hide glue I mix up really thin so it stays uh, liquid for a long period of time. Paint a bit of that over all the bindings. This is kind of an unnecessary step if you're uh, in a uniformly dry climate, but where I live it kind of um, fluctuates, and when it fluctuates, um, if you don't have this uh, glue on here, um, your bindings shrink and grow. And then what you have is um, sometimes your uh, your bindings will come uh, a little bit looser. That shouldn't be be critical on finger loops, but sometimes when you tie down a 
uh, a lot of weight that way, um, and it expands and contracts, well then you, um, you're a, your lot of weight um, can slide around on your shaft. But anyway, that's the, that's the finger loops. At this point, they are perfectly sized to my fingers. They uh, have no, no wobble in them. I can basically support the atlatl on my fingers, uh, which is uh, perfect. That's the way I like my, way I like my atlatls to be. And um, when it uh, dries up, this will be a, um, a very nice thrower. So thank you very much for watching, and I hope you, uh, hope you can um, use what you've seen. If you'd like to learn more about the dart throwers of Native America, please visit basketmakeratlatl.com. Or for discussion of atlatls and atlatl-related um, things, go ahead and visit paleoplanet.net and go to the World Atlatl Association General Discussion Forum. Thanks for watching.